The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon. Um, welcome to another D-Link uh, webinar. Um, this week, uh, we're going to be talking about Wi-Fi 6 and how it can impact your business. Um, the actual title is The End of Slow Business, kind of illustrated by just how fast that animation was then. Uh, with me, as always, is um, our technical pre-sales engineer, Craig Kirby. Hello, everyone. Um, back once again to talk about Wi-Fi 6, Craig, but this time with a business slant as opposed to what we did back in March now. Gosh, that was a while ago, wasn't it? It was. Feels like an age, doesn't it? <laughs> um, let's, uh, let's start off with the timeline. Um, the last time we did this, which was the consumer um, the consumer webinar, we had the Back to the Future theme, which, uh, which proved to be quite popular. Um, but we didn't want to reuse the graphics um, in case of any... Um, uh, any any complaints about flashing images? So we thought we'd come up with a uh, a a more suitable and somber timeline, but nonetheless um, illustrating the 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 big changes in Wi-Fi um, across the uh, across the um, across the calendar timeline. There. Um, so starting all the way back in 1997 uh, with Wi-Fi One. Um, Massive, big changes in and around 2012 when Wi-Fi 5 came in. Uh, 2015 was when uh, Wave 2 came in and uh, introduced Moo Mimo, which, um, which we'll talk about a little bit more later on because Moo Mimo is upgraded on Wi-Fi 6 um, up to 2019. So last year, Wi-Fi 6 was... Uh, announced, but uh, most of the major plays have been made in Wi-Fi 6 in 2020. I think mean, that's fair to say, Craig, uh, because of the uh, because of the um, uh, finalising of what Wi-Fi 6 is and all of the bits and um, uh, features that it needs to be properly Wi-Fi 6, as we talked about. That's right. One. And, and just to point out, it's some people might be taken by the names saying it's Wi-Fi 1 to 6. That's actually retroactively named. It's something that we've only started using over the last year or so, I would say. Yeah. Um, and that's really just to get away from the names like 802.11b, G, N, <laughs> where people are obviously very confused. It can be get very confusing. So yeah. one, to, 1 to 6 is a much better one. I think. It, it is, especially the difference between AC and AX, because that can, yeah, that can be G and N, I mean, you know, big difference but um, AC and AX, I mean, you could you could read that and, and misconstrue which generation you were looking at. So five and yeah. six, much easier, much more wrong That's still, right. as you say. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I think the thing to take away from this is that um, Wave 2 is considered Wi-Fi 5 rather than being the next iteration. That's because it was a slight difference to the original AC release. Wave 2 bring in some new technologies and things, but wasn't enough to actually give it a new whole number in yeah. itself. It was, um, it was so. evolution rather than revolution, isn't it? That's the old revolution. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Uh, so Wi-Fi 5 introduced orthogonal frequency division multiplexing. I was very careful um, when I said that because um, very easy to get that one wrong, even if you, you, you know what it is. Um, I think, Craig, you're probably better place to, to go through this because this is a bit technical here. Um, so OFDM is really just what we've been using over for many years, actually, and, and other networks. Uh, really, it's about how the information is transported around a network and how much data load that you can get in any kind of frame or sometimes called packet, um, sometimes used interchangeably. It's really just about how that information is actually transported across a Wi-Fi network. Yeah. One of the things to remember is probably that um, Wi-Fi has technology that we use for around uh, to broadcast, which has really come from those old wired networks. So it's kind of been shoehorned in over the years. Yeah. Um, so very old technology, but shoehorned in. So what, what we do now is really we try and bring new technologies to try and make sure that our Wi-Fi performs better, even though we're kind of building upon that old legacy system. Yeah. Um, so let's have a look at how that changes over time. So with the inclusion of Wi-Fi 6, we're now looking at orthogonal frequency division, multiple access. So what we're doing is we're making sure that the latency uh, across our whole network is improved. 
And we do that by actually taking those frames and making sure that the data is more efficient in the types of information that's being passed along. Um, so here in our example, we've got three different pieces of information, one being web page, Zoom and Skype. Um, and the way that's actually transported on a Wi-Fi 6 network is more efficient because the payload itself is um, is looked at rather than just carelessly transported across. Um, it's obviously a little bit technical. I won't go into too many of the details now, um, but that's what you get with Wi-Fi 6, that improved latency, which means yeah. if you're a gamer or anything like that, or if you have uh, fast files, or more importantly, VoIP calls and things like that, where data is not so much big, but uh, needs to be moved fast across the network, that's where it helps. I think I think that from a business perspective, with the increase in uh, Zoom calls, the increase in Skype, but still giving uh, enough enough bandwidth and, and, and traffic to to the, the, the older stuff, the VoIP calls and stuff like that, Greg, that's definitely um, stuff that we uh, will be improved by uh, OFDMA, the, the upgrades uh, from Wi-Fi 5. So. It, it absolutely is. And when you think about Wi-Fi 5 and 6, mm. 6 especially in this case, being integrated with other services like 5G in the future, and that's what we're really going to see. We're going to see a combination of technologies to try and reduce latency. Mm. Now, 5G is coming out very soon. Well, it's here. Um, we'll have devices very soon. For, for purchase yep. and what that means is in combination with Wi-Fi 6 we can start thinking about real use case scenarios of being outside using our, our technology for that really fast experience yeah. and having finally having that 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 piece where we're outside Mm. using a system that's as good as being inside on a wide network. Well, it could even be better. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, for me, 4G has been an absolute uh, brilliant uh, send for me because my old system is a VDSL in my house. Right. I I'm lucky to get sort of 30 megabits per second, mm. which is okay for some things. Um, but on, on a 4G LTE, I can hit data rates of 70 or 80 megabits per second. Okay. So it's it's far superior. The only problem with it is latency. So if you're a gamer and, and, and you've ever tried to use 4G, you might see that you issue on a server mm. um, and that server is, is trying to get that information to you. On 5G, you're not going to get that issue. So if you implement that 5G in the Wi-Fi network, mm. um, that's going to be much better. The, the, the only problem for gamers, Craig, is that they can't blame the latency anymore once 5G and Wi-Fi 6 come out. <laughs> it was it was delay that got me um, got me beat on Call of Duty or made me consider <laughs> FIFA. You're going to run out of excuses. So <laughs> that's right. It's not your age and the fact that you have four hours sleep every night. <laughs> oh yes, my, my reflexes have gone. No. <laughs> uh, we mentioned we mentioned Mu um, Mu Mimo earlier and we we know that Mumimo has been around since uh 2015 which as we as, as we touched on was the the evolution of of, of wave two or of wireless ac if if you prefer um but the the, the big part about wi-fi 6 and and the reason that wi-fi 6 will improve the speed with Mumimo is that the this has been applied to the 2.4 um, gigahertz spectrum now, whereas before it was only on the five gigahertz spectrum. Um, so that's going to allow improved speed on, on both bandwidths um, for, for your home connections, which will be, which will be great because um, your, 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 your lower bandwidth products um, can, can now receive a better performance um, on, under Wi-Fi 6. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think this one is going to be more interesting to those who maybe didn't buy into Wave 2 devices. Maybe you waited or maybe you had an install only a few years ago and it didn't make sense to buy into Wave 2. Um, if you are going to be looking at the AX generation, then this is a technology that's come over from it. And what, was, what this really does is it means it's, it serves devices um, in, in a multiple way. So imagine an access point having to talk to four devices. Uh, all at the same time, they're all requesting that data. Normally on a single user, uh, MIMO, you're doing one each one individually. So you do one, then to the second, then to the third, then to the fourth. Uh, now with Wave 2, this introduced multi-user MIMO where all four of those devices would be served 
at the same time mm. uh, and that's what AX has. Now like Alan said we're actually having that same system not just on the 5 gigahertz which is really what where all the work has been done over the last few years we're actually going to have that integrated into the 2.4 gigahertz that wasn't available on wave 2 that wasn't there um, so we're absolutely um, in implementing these 2.4 gigahertz technologies even if you have wave 2 devices you wouldn't have benefited from that because it never did that 2.4 piece um, so this is where AX is really important, not just for that five gigahertz, that two point four gigahertz side. Yeah, we did, we did a great we did a great bite size that involved Moon Mimo, didn't we, Craig? Before where we did the illustration about the traffic moving um, the different lanes with different speeds and and being different products. So um, uh, if if you want to know more about Moon Mimo, check out check out the bite size that we did um, on that previously. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Improved throughput. Um, so improved throughput comes with the advent of quadrature amplitude modulation. <laughs> <laughs> that very slowly again. Um, it's um, and what's happened with that is that we've had an increase from the old 1024 QAM, as we'll call it. Um, that's increased up from 256 QAM, which we had previously. Uh, which has allowed us to increase data rate throughput by 25 percent um so well worth having um so we we, we can see here that wi-fi 6 isn't just about speed we've got improved latency and now we've got improved throughput so even if um your your, your home network isn't super powerful uh, you can still get um some real good benefits uh, from from wi-fi 6 or your business yeah. network or whichever yeah yeah, I think it's so interesting this part um, when it comes to the business sector because um, especially uh, we've done some education in stores over the last few years yeah. um, and what we'll see in time and time again is it's less about broadcast where we're doing this big broadcast. Yes, we do do that um, and we do have devices for it, but really it's about how many users we can support per access point sure. and how much data we can pass through the network. That's really where it's important. Mm. Um, so for example, I did a few um, wireless site surveys where we've had some schools, maybe there's been about three or four classrooms in a very localized area. We turn the broadcast power down on those, um, but we still need to make sure that we got that data pumping through there for 30 kids per room. Mm. Um, so a lot of data has to pass through. If we can push all of these technologies into that kind of environment, then imagine all these kids coming along with uh, Chromebooks and then you have bring your own device on the network as well, yeah. people passing on the corridors, roaming around the, around the building. You have to account for all of these things to make sure that your network is capable of supporting these children for their learning, which is so important, of course. Yeah. Um, and that, that's really where it comes in. Well, and and, and as, uh, it applies to other businesses as well, Craig. Obviously, with iPads and and phones, the, the first thing that you do when you get to your office is make sure you're connected to the Wi-Fi, um, your, your iPad. So, we, we Wi-Fi six is going to be great for the extra capacity and 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 that for, yeah. for all of these um, devices in, in in an office block, which is just going to. Um, uh, just going to improve things notably because um <clears throat> yeah absolutely and that's that's another thing alan is when you have the device that's able to support more users um it means the limitation on the amount of devices you need so mm -hmm. if you've got a very large uh, area that you need to cover um you can put in some four by four access points but maybe you won't need so many um, because they'll support more users, the uh, yep. improved efficiency of those devices will be better, they'll be quicker served, um, and that's the thing, when you have a large network, especially when you start implementing um, 10 gig networks um, and, and AX devices such as this, then you really are going to be hitting those higher speeds through your LAN, yeah. um, and the access point will be able to serve people faster, data will be passed faster, which means that there's more room, more time for other data to go pass through, and more users, so you're actually limiting, yeah. um, not uh, unlimiting the amount of users, should I well, it's, say, it's, it, access point. Yeah, it's, it's, um, it, it's, Wi-Fi 6 is often talked about as one of the big improvements is it's um, it, the, the, the density of, uh, of the signal so more people can can connect to it at the same time so um, um, and another another big plus point there um, 
let's move on to um, target wake time, um, which is all about improved battery life. Um, so instead of um, instead of the devices queuing up um, for, for, for connections one at a time, or all trying to um, push through um, to get their wireless signal, uh, what happens with target wait time is that it schedules uh, the, uh, the the connections. So we can see on the, on the diagram there all of the robotic parts of the factory trying to get their connection at the same time. Um, trying to push through constant messages to the access point, uh, which is going to cause a drain on the battery. Um, and whereas at home, we'll, we'll have a few devices, maybe a phone, maybe an iPad, all that kind of stuff. Uh, it won't have such an impact. But in, in a factory, which will have thousands and thousands of these sensory devices trying to connect at the same time, um, the impacts of, uh, of battery life and the reduced power consumption could be very, very uh, beneficial to the to, to the factory. So if we if we have a look at how it works uh, when target wait time is enabled, um, you can see there that um, um, the the different devices are, are put to put to sleep, put on standby uh, whilst they don't need a signal, while they don't um, don't need to be served. Um, so uh, a, a great uh, another great addition there, um, which um, is, is part of the Wi-Fi 6 package. And as, as we mentioned earlier, a lot, a lot of the, the Wi-Fi 6 being launched in 2019, but you will see on earlier devices that target wait time wasn't included on all of those um, pieces, but it is included on all of our, um, all of our access points. So, um, yeah, absolutely. I, I think I just want to clear it up at this point, Alan, that um, when we're talking about these newer technologies being able to use target wait time, we are talking about Wi-Fi 6 clients as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. So if you've got a new phone that's that's Wi-Fi 6 compatible, what will I happen do. is that, uh, good, good for you. <laughs> um, what that means is that it will talk to the router and it will communicate about what kind of access it needs and when. That's what the target wait time does. Yeah. And then it doesn't have to do that until that time. It doesn't have to keep doing it. And that's where the battery drains all the time. Yeah. It's just a way, it's a way of preserving the battery life um, because it doesn't always have to connect at intervals. And I mean, we're talking like it's gonna be minutes here. It's not actually minutes that we're talking about. This is happening on a, on a almost microsecond scope, um, but that's enough to improve the battery life because it happens so often. Um, in, in the current environment, when you have these uh, target wait times enabled correctly, um, you will find improved battery life no matter how you use it. Brilliant. Uh, BSS basic surface set coloring. Um, so this is the this is the part of um, Wi-Fi six which will reduce interference and uh, network um, congestion for you. So the, 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 the access point or, or, or the router in a home environment um, does what, what we've referred to as inject coloring. So we've, we've illustrated this coloring on the, on the diagram um, in front of you. So the, the old Wi-Fi 5 example over on the left side there, um, two white circles, and in the place where the, um, where the access points overlap or the routers overlap, that there is a um, there is interference um, in that in that area. Whereas on the uh, on on the Wi-Fi six front, we, we've we've got blue injected into one and pink injected into the other there. Um, so there's no the, the, there's no interference between the two um, uh, between the two uh, uh, coverage areas. So. Uh, what Wi-Fi 6 will also do is if it is injecting the same color, so for instance, if both access points were um, in, in injecting blue, um, which we call color collision, it will change change the color on, on its own um, to allow the device to ignore uh, the overlapping signals. So uh, a really big increase in um in network interference there with with your wi-fi 6 access points so no 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 drop off between overlapping areas yeah that's that's one of the really good things and this is really going to be appropriate for anybody that's living in a perhaps a, a shared building 
mm -hmm. um, where there's a lot of broadcast. People have their own routers broadcasting out uh, because they obviously have to run on the same channel. So they all, the 2.4, it's sort of uh, for that 1 to 11 period or 1 to 13, actually. Most yeah. people use around 1 to 11. But if everybody's using the same kind of channels, um, that that absorbs, I suppose you would say, all of the, the bandwidth that's available to everybody because there's so many devices, so many broadcasts, and all overlapping. BSS coloring is designed to actually clear that up so that you can get your connection and the devices aren't fighting for each other and that's that's a really unique uh, selling point for our uh, for, for wireless six I think okay um, so what what have we got to to offer businesses um, so our, our range of access points um, Come in the come in three different um, molds. So we have Nucleus Cloud, we have Nucleus Connect, um, and then we have the, the the unified options. So each one of these will be um, will be applicable to whichever kind of whichever kind of business you have, whether you're a, a small coffee shop or or if you want to do a a much much bigger and, and wider deployment. Um, so what we we'll do over the next few slides is we'll have a look at um, the, um, the the access points that we have available in in each of these areas and where we think that um, they would be the most productive. So let's um, let's start off with with Nucleus Cloud. Um, so Nucleus Cloud is is designed for um, smaller organisations um, and. It's, it's zero touch deployment allows it to be easily installed uh, in companies that have limited IT knowledge or budget, uh, which is also um, also impacted upon by how easy the software is to manage. It can all be managed remotely off site. Um, so we have two access points coming for Nucleus Cloud, uh, the DBA 2830P, uh, which is actually available now. Uh, and that's an AX3600 4x4 model. So that's our top of the range. Um, that's going to that's gonna power a lot of people in, in your school, no problem. High density area um, got you covered. Um, and then we've got our, our lower speed, slightly lower spec model, which is the DBA 1230P. Uh, and that's an AX1800 2x2 model. So probably suitable for slightly lower traffic areas. Um, or, you know, every good install is, is, is a mix of the two, um, as, as Craig will no doubt attest. <laughs> <laughs> it is, yeah. You, normally, uh, you can't really do a big install without using a couple of these devices. Mm. Um, one thing I will say about the Nucleus Cloud product is that uh, it's, it's kind of designed for everybody, actually. And it's a fully scalable solution, so it's absolutely aimed at enterprise and it's absolutely aimed at those uh, smaller ones and twos yeah. access point installs. Um, so anybody that, that doesn't have a technical team available, does want to do some things themselves, and you're an end user, certainly think about going cloud as well, yeah. um, because it means that you don't ever have to worry about any kind of server software uh, or monitorings or any kind of devices like that. It's all, it's all cloud-based. You just use it as a web login and you can change all of the devices. Yeah. Um, like, like Alan said, we've got two of the models. So the 4x4 is really good for that big broadcast um, and also does more users as well. Uh, and the 2x2 is there for that smaller, small business install. It can either sit on the desk or you can wall mount it. Both of these PoE powered. Um, just to be clear, the 4x4 access point does actually come with two LAN ports on there. Ooh. Now that second LAN port is actually for um, link aggregation. And what that means is that you can have two cables going to the device. If you don't have a 10 gig network or a 2.5 gig network, um, two cables going to the device so that you can use your older switching technology. So if you've got yeah. a one gigabit port, it becomes a two gigabit port. So you can specialize and, and utilize that AX part where you've got faster speeds for the wireless and you're delivering it to the rest of your networks but yeah. fast yeah uh, you, you were 100 right earlier craig when you said about that it's um uh, we when we talk about nucleus cloud it, it was designed uh, for smaller organizations but it is um as, as the second bullet point says uh, virtually unlimited scalability so um to, just 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 to make that clear this is a great option for a little coffee shop but it's 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 equally a great option for an enterprise business with 500 employees um it's just designed to be easy enough for that coffee shop to put it in with with no issues so 
<laughs> no one to put off any big business from, from Nucleus Cloud. It's, it's a fantastic um, uh, platform for you guys as well. Um, Nucleus Connect, um, again, we're, we're pitching that one in as slightly slightly larger organizations because they, they, they probably need more um, control and customizations um, uh, over their network. Um, so, so Nucleus Connect is ostensibly a, 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 a software-based um, platform. Um, we do have a Nucleus Connect hub, which is an, an, an optional um, an optional add-on if you don't have a dedicated PC unit for it. The, the hub is very inexpensive and can manage up to 100 APs at one time. So um, a great option on there. Um, so we've got the two access points. Again, same speeds and, and, and same spec as, as previously. The, the X2850 is, um, is our 3,600 4x4, and then the X2810 is our AX 2x2 model. So once again, we've got a high and, and a low density option there for, for anybody interested. Yeah, it is, again, it's very similar in terms of what you can actually do with these access points. Um, Nucleus Connect is obviously aimed at our software controller install. It's a piece of software that can run on a standard Windows machine, whether it's server or a normal operating system. Um, and that means that allows you to control up to a thousand access points. Um, thing with the Nucleus Connect, uh, it can also be installed in the cloud too. So. If you want to run your own cloud, you're absolutely more than welcome to. It's a free piece of software and you can install that into places like Microsoft Azure or Amazon's web services. Mm. And that allows you to give that connectivity. It does mean that you are obviously having to set up the software yourself and controlling the backups and things like that. So it's really Nucleus Connect is aimed at those who are trying to get away perhaps with the licenses, maybe don't want to pay a license fees, yeah. um, but are happy to do that, that, that mechanical part yourself. Uh, and that kind of backups um, and just running your own server. If, you, if you're familiar with that kind of environment, the Nucleus Connect is very much something that might be suitable for you. Uh, last but not least, um, we, we, we have Unified. So our, our option for um, the most demanding um, uh, wireless networks. So um, Unified is, is, isn't cloud managers as the, as the previous two were or, or can be. Um, it, uh, you know, obviously your choice when it comes to Nucleus Connect. Uh, we just we, we have the the one access point here, the the DWL eighty six thirty AP, which I always refer to as the as the smoke alarm. Um, obviously designed that way to to blend in, um, and this piece is is controlled by the dedicated hardware controller. Uh, on the screen there, you can see the DWC one thousand and the DWC two thousand. Uh, options um, in this in this area. Um, so the unified is the um, it's the it's the option for the most um, would you say qualified or the most experienced network builders out there because of the the level of precision of control that you have over all of the features on the network is is is, is about the highest. Um, uh, when when it comes to, to to building, and you can really go down into the minutia of your RAM of your control policies with this, this option. It is, yeah. It's, it's a very advanced piece of technology, and it really allows you to do that roaming piece, the fast roaming side. Um, this is something that we've had for a while now. Our DWC controllers, and they've always run with our AAC access points and our integrate access points. Um, so obviously we don't want to leave anybody behind that has invested into the hardware controllers. So hence why we're bringing out an AP for you guys, um, so that you can you can benefit from those AX speeds. Um, anyone that's not really seen the hardware controller before, um, what it allows you to do is some uh, additional license upgrades. So if you want to run VPNs or even run it as a gateway for that uh, DWC 1000, it's possible. Mm. Our DWC 2000 controller is also designed to run um, some. Um, redundancy on the actual wireless network. So what that means is that you can have multiple controllers. If one of those controllers down your Wi-Fi network doesn't degrade, it can carry over to another controller. And it also means that you can extend out those uh, larger environments as well. So obviously this was something that was before Nucleus Cloud, which is fully scalable. This was our largest solution before Nucleus Cloud. Um, and it goes up to about 1,024 access points when you run those licenses and the um, additional controllers. Wow. 
Okay. Um, moving on from the products now, as um, Craig mentioned, um, 5G earlier. Um, so we can see from the solution here, we, we briefly briefly touched on this. So, so, so the idea is, is that um, um, part of the, the D-Link infrastructure is going to be uh, Wi-Fi 6 for indoors and then, and then 5G for, for outdoors. And um, uh, we do have some products coming in this, um, in, in this area. Uh, unfortunately, they, uh, the, the main one that, uh, which we'll talk about has been delayed until um, January, but uh, you, you can't present Wi-Fi 6 without talking about 5G. It's, it's the, the two solutions, they just go hand in hand. So uh, the, the switch from, from, from your um, uh, super fast connection in the office to your super fast connection outside is going to be absolutely seamless, um, um, especially if you choose to, to, to take that solution up with D-Link and our products that we have coming in this area. Yeah, I, I think that's this is the most unique time for wireless, um, yeah. and it's really because that we're 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 seeing this change to five G and Wi Fi six at the same time, and they're going to be working in collaboration with each other to get these hybrid systems going. It's going to be yeah. really fun to see how we can get Wi Fi and how we can have our new network systems when in. in just anything really yeah. really anything and we've seen already park benches just sit down at a park bench you've got usb ports there at the moment to charge everything up <laughs> um fight coming from the telephone boxes as you walk around london it's, it's it's a really interesting time so when we can start integrating our cars and and everything else into that kind of environment we're literally walking around this world where everything is connected finally and we're connected at speeds where it actually makes sense to get things done you can't hide from the from from the future of wireless. It's it's going to be everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> the brief, briefly touched on the the, the DWR um, two one o one. This is this is our mobile um, hotspot, which we're, we're all looking we're all looking forward to. Um, uh, D Link. It's it's a shame it's been it's been delayed, but we are looking at um, at a Q one release date. Um, and I mean, I've I have a five G phone, but to be honest, the the times that I can pick up a five G signal, um, it's it's not that often unless you venture into a a town centre or um, into into the centre of London, as 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 it were. Um, but when I do, um, those speeds are absolutely fantastic, and and I don't want to leave. But um, <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately, I live in I, I live somewhere fairly leafy, so so five G is 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 coming soon. Um, so um, the, the 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 mobile hotspot is is going to be a great device. Um, you can see from the the advertisement there, it's take your five G wherever you go. Um, he says it, it's 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 viable at home. It's viable when you go on a trip, or you just take it into the office. Um, and um, this the speeds, the the sharing, and and the battery life, and everything just add up to a a a very good product that's um, 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 going to be available soon. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And uh, to be honest with you, Alan, I'm quite impressed at how fast the 5G rollout is actually coming at the moment. Yes. Um, yeah. I, I'm, I myself was upgraded in the area only only a couple of weeks ago, and it took oh. three days for them to uh, pull everything down and put everything up for 5G. So it's oh. it's very quick. They're, well, they're, they're, they're mini getting it out there. They're mini towers, aren't they? So unlike the 4G, they're they're a lot smaller and they're a lot easier to to put up. And unlike the 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 massive 4G masts that you see, uh, it's just they have to do more of them, don't they? So um, yeah, that's right. Yeah, I'll I'll lend you my phone, Craig, and you can see how far the uh, <laughs> the, the, the Saturn. You can come around for dinner and try it yourself. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've got a 5G sim as well, so very. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, to, to paraphrase a, a previous webinar that we did, um, switch your switch. Um, if if Wi-Fi six um, in, to, to to fully exploit it, you, we really need to look at uh, what we've got at the core of your network. Um, so what we are doing is we are launching a new range of um, 10, 10 gig switches with two point five gigabyte uplinks. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong there, Craig. I think I'm right, but I'm... <laughs> that's correct. Yes, yeah, absolutely correct, Alan. <laughs> so we've we've designed these switches um, to be aggregation layers and, and access switches, and and um, and as I've said, this is really going to um, 
uh, prop up the backbone. So you, you're going to, you, if if you are interested in Wi-Fi six, then you probably do need to look at at the switches. And uh, the big upgrade on these is this um, two point five gigabit PoE port that, that we've got, uh, which you can directly power uh, any of the new Wi-Fi six access points from. Um, so. Uh, definitely worth considering if you're at all interested in in Wi-Fi six and upselling to your customers there. Yeah, so this really is the uh, the last piece of the puzzle, I suppose we would say. Yeah, yeah. Um, having that network that can actually make use of those AX speeds. There's no point in having one cable going to an access point and that access point is able to do over a gigabit speed when you've only limited to a gigabit port. Uh, that's PoE for that power for it, and you're not going to go exceeding that. So that's what we're we're introducing these switches for, so that we can power the new devices and and get those 2.5 gigabit speeds PoE powered, so we can still bring it up to those uh, 100 meter lengths uh, or 80 meter lengths if you're doing PoE is what we say, um, and and that that really makes more sense than uh, trying to link aggregate because it means that we can use a Cat6 cable to to push out to the access point and we don't have to do multiple cables for it because it can be expensive to run new cables sometimes yeah. um, and if you are replacing um, an access point like for like into a point then we are able to pass that over cat5 you see so we don't have to use a cat6 cable we don't have to think about upgrading yeah. the cat the the quality of the ethernet cable the old cable will still be able to run at 2.5 speed no oh, craig saving everyone money there thanks craig. yeah <laughs> We'd rather you spent the money on the switches than the cables. I think that's the message, isn't it? <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Well, in this way, this is the whole point. So what they tried to do originally was um, they tried to push out 10 gig via a standard Cat 5e cable, but it wasn't possible. But what they did get was that 2.4, that 2.5 and the 5 gigahertz speeds. Right. Um, so it is possible to get those speeds through the cable. You just need to have the newer technology to pass it through. And that's where we stand with it. Sure. Um, so these new switches, um, low, low network latency, high PoE budget. I get all of the hard pronunciations right, and then I can't say low network latency. I apologize. Um, <laughs> uh, so as, as we've discussed, they, they come with high um, gigabit port density, a very large um, speed requirement per port. Um, they, they have 370 watts total PoE budget, so that's up to 30 watts per port, um, and that's on the... Um, 1520 28MP and the 1520-52MP uh, models. These are available non-POE, so that would just be the 1520-28 and the 1520-52. So sorry, a bit of a tongue twister there again. Uh, but um, yeah, so, so POE and non-POE options are available um, uh, with these products. Yeah, absolutely. And and what's really important to think about is how much budget that you've got throughout the switch. If you're using one of these devices in a stack, because they are stackable devices, and you only have one switch that's PoE and it has to power all of your access points, then you're going to need a higher PoE budget that's available to you. Standard for our PoE switches is about 193 watts. So if you've got some access points that's sort of 10 watts each for example you're only going to get about 16 of those then that's not even factoring in the four by four access points which are actually above that 15.4 watts um, which brings us into 802.3 uh, AT that's an AT standard on one of these larger access points they actually draw probably about 20 or so 22 watts when they're idle but they can go up to 30 watts from some of these devices so do keep an eye out for it because Obviously, bigger access points require bigger power to to power, and you have to factor that in at the uh, at the at the back end on your switches as well. Yeah. So do be do be aware of that. Um, Craig Craig touched on it just then. He mentioned um, switching. Uh, sorry, stacking, not switching. <laughs> stacking. <laughs> sorry, I've, I've 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 gone off I've gone off the boil here. Um, <laughs> so I, I'm not going to say a word now, and I'm just going to let Craig talk about stacking because this is this is why Craig is here. This is uh, this is your friend. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I think we've actually done some some bits on stacking before in the past. So uh, apologies if you if you are uh, up to speed on stacking. However, we bring in some newer technologies. Um, now this is actually something that we've seen on our DGS thirty one thirty product, um, and we'll be going forward with because it's done so well on that. So that was a layer three device. This is a layer two plus device that we're looking at. So it's it's a slightly 
um, less features on our 1520, but it's really designed for uh, that edge piece. Now, stacking components has always been in our portfolio, uh, SFP Plus, and you generally have two ports of SFP to do your stack and make your ring so that you've got redundancy across switches. Point being that if any one of those switches goes down, it doesn't affect the rest of the stack, and you can uplink stacks together and get that redundancy in. So that's the point stacking. However, when you think about it, when you have a stack of switches and you have things like servers that are going in, that, that information has to pass from switch to switch still, same as it would be if it was linked. So what stacking does is it allows us to increase the amount of throughput through a stack itself. Now how this switch differs from the other switches is that we've integrated two extra ports and these are 10 gig G base, 10 G base T ports, which are 10 gig. Now in combination with the SFP plus ports, we can choose how we want to stack. So now we can do copper stacking, which is where we use a CAT6 cable, and you just pass the whole stack through and it does it using um, your, your standard ethernet frames. You can do it the old fashioned way where we've got fiber stacking and you just use fiber ports. And more importantly, we've got hybrid stacking. This might be new to a lot of people. Hybrid stacking means you can use both CAT6 cables and those SFP plus ports to increase the amount of throughput that goes through a stack. So you can get 80 gigabits per second through the stack. That's full duplex speeds, um, which is which is quite a lot. It's about 120 gigabits uh, full duplex actually through the stack. So if you've got servers um, and lots of devices connecting back to a central point, that's really where it's going to benefit because you're going to get massive amounts of speed passing through those switches in the stack. And if that's operating as your core network, then it's happy days, especially if you're using things like uh, QNAP devices in any kind of SANs. Did I bore you, Alan? Are no, you asleep? No, 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 no. <laughs> I, I was here and um, I was listening intently, although don't ask me to repeat what you said. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the last slide for today, um, again, uh, just, just looking at a little bit um, a, little, a few options here of, of, of the different bits that we can do and really emphasizing those four times 2.5 uh, gigabit ethernet ports, which really allow you to make the most of your, your potential Wi-Fi 6, um, your Wi-Fi 6 networks there. So a, a, couple, of, a couple of examples there. Um, I, think, I think if we want um, to hear Craig talk about stacking more, not ruining next, the next webinar, but um, definitely join us for, for that because Craig's going to be talking about redundancy. Um, and I, th I think it's fairly safe to say that we'll go into stacking in a little bit more detail on that one again. So. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, so no spoilers, but we do need to talk <laughs> about stacking here. Um, so we can see in our example that you've got a set of stacks, which is now if we, if we counter for what we just talked about, where we've got a copper stack and where we've got SFP stacks, let's say for example, that we've used those technologies in this environment, we've stacked those devices, and we've got some really good throughput coming through the devices. Now you'll have some of these servers, some of these NAS drives that plug in into one switch, let's say it's the top switch, and then we've got our edge-based devices with our Wi-Fi 6A AP devices, which is bringing in some lots and lots of extra traffic. That's going back to our pipeline, going up to our stack. And we, we've connected those with 10 gig technology from our edge now, from our access area to our, our aggregation and core area. Now we've actually got a future-proof environment that factors in Wi-Fi 6, factors in redundancy, factors in how we can get to our servers. And that's really where we are now as a company. We're, we're, we're looking at these technologies uh, and helping you guys implement a solution that's future-proof, um, schools, educations, hospitality sectors, where especially when you're thinking about new Wi-Fi experiences, um, new experiences when it comes to just watching TV, passing that through multicasting, all of these things are coming into play and they have to be factored in. Yeah. Um, and making that management piece there as well, because if you look at that stack, that's all one, a, uh, one IP address to control all the devices, one interface that you log in through to control it uh, in that stacked environment as well. Mm. And if you are a hospitality business, um, definitely go back and listen to the last webinar we did on, on Wi-Fi 6, where we talked about, um, sorry, the last webinar we did on Nucleus Cloud, which uh, has Wi-Fi 6 access points available, but we talked about the, the marketing and, and everything else that you can get from, from Nucleus Cloud on, on that episode. So well worth um, a listen back to that. If you missed last week's episode, uh, sorry, uh, last fortnight's episode, um, if you've got any customers in, in the hospitality area, because Nucleus Cloud has some great, great um, applications there. 
so that's that's it for for the slides today. We do have um, a few questions, Craig. Um, okay. I, yeah. Unfortunately, you're going to have to take most of them. <laughs> no problem. Cool, but you're more than used to that. Um, <laughs> I mean, I can answer the first one, but it's probably better that, that you do. Um, so why why is cloud managed or centralized management better than using hardware controllers? Okay, so it really is going to be down to what you're looking for and, and the yeah. individual end user. But ultimately, cloud is so much easier to to change all of the configuration settings. Mm -hmm. With cloud provisioning, what that means is you don't have to even touch the access points in order to configure them. And I, I really do mean you don't have to touch them, as in you don't even have to take them out of the box. Yeah. Uh, on the edge of the box, you'll have a code, which is a unique ID code. Now, if you have a cloud account, you just log on to your account put that code in and you can already start setting up the configuration of it. Then you can send that access point out to anywhere in the world, plug it in and it will automatically provision the configuration from the cloud back to the AP and it'll be up and running to your configuration that you've set it to. So that's really something that cloud will give you that nothing else really will. That zero touch provisioning, that's what we mean by zero touch. Yeah, just just note that when you plug it in, you do have to take it out of the box, otherwise it won't work. <laughs> so make sure you do well, that. First. You could put the cable to the access point and keep it in the box, it's possible. Well, it's you, possible. Could, you, could, yeah, you could, you could put a hole in the side, yeah, but don't, don't, just take it out. <laughs> um, Next question, what are the benefits of 5G for IoT versus LoRa, NB hyphen IoT, et cetera? So 5G, well, we're, we're kind of talking about Wi-Fi 6 today, but 5G is really what we're going to be looking at for IoT. And that brings in the technologies that allows that, uh, like I said, TWT piece where we're looking at uh, target wake times for devices that are around. So, for example, if you're rolling out 5G in areas such as traffic lights, traffic signals, that sort of thing, then we're really going to be looking at that kind of extra piece for connectivity. But that's really on that, that 5G side of things, not so much the Wi-Fi 6. Well, um, we are, we'll be talking about 5G very very soon yeah. um, and we'll go into that in a little bit more detail yeah we, we, we've got a what's big in 2021 um, webinar plan for coming up shortly and I'm sure we'll go more into 5g on that one um, do we have any business cases for the 5g hotspot that I can talk to my customers about um, not not yet um, but watch this space we'll we'll try and get uh, any information in that space that we we, we can do uh, we do have a great 5g white paper which you can um request if you um either just drop us an email or if you look in the document section on on the dlink website it's available on there uh, but that's more about talking about the um the the, the theory of 5g how it works etc etc um, I think we've missed a question there, and uh, I'll read it out for you. Uh, are there any home routers that we will be selling with Wi-Fi 6? Okay, well, that was that was next on my list, Greg. Um... Oh, was it 6? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, um, yes. Um, as we talked about back in March, uh, we have a range of um, free Wi-Fi 6 routers. Uh, we have the DIR X1560, the X1860, and the X5460. The 1560 doesn't have the full range of Wi-Fi 6 features that we've talked about today. Um, you will need to check uh, what that does. It is. It does have the Wi-Fi 6 increased capacity. It does have the extra speed, um, but it doesn't have all of the features um, available on it. So um, check the fact sheet on that one. But that's the that's the entry level budget model, um, and it, it, it's priced accordingly. I think it's about seventy five. Uh, pounds on on Amazon, so it's a it's the budget model all the way up to the fifty four sixty, which um, arrived in our um, arrived in our depot the other day. So we're we're all excited to get that uh, and and the scramble to be the first to install our new fifty fifty AX fifty four hundred router in our home, so we can get super fast home broadband. Uh, that's underway at the moment, but I think. I think Craig usually wins because he's the technical guy, so uh, he has he has connections in the right uh, uh, places. <laughs> um, coming 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 in Q one, um, hopefully sooner rather than later, is the is going to be an extension um, point for that. The the AX um, eighteen sixty is 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 a um, so the D, DIRX eighteen sixty is a very good model. 
Uh, but for, for larger properties, it will um, probably need an extension point because it only has the four antennas. Um, so we do have um, a, a, an extender coming for, for Wi-Fi 6, hopefully January, but definitely in Q1 next year. So um, I'm, I'm sure you'll hear more about that in future webinars. Okay, excellent. I think we got another question from uh, from Luke here. Luke, yes. He says, um, what is the real estimated POE use for DWL access point on datasheet 20 watts real? I think what Luke is asking, uh, real estimated POE use for DWL access point. Uh, a DWL access point um, depends on the access point, Luke. Um, so, for example, we, we had an 8610, which I think is end of life now. Um, but that was an 802.1180 access point, which drew, um, we, we say 30 watts. It, I, it was installed into some theaters, actually. Hmm. Um, and what we were seeing uh, at high levels of usage, it did pull up to about 22 watts of power. Um, so it definitely does does use that kind of wattage. Now, the thing is, even if it's 22 watts, that, that's still over 15.4 watts of power. So there's no way that it's going to run on that AF standard, which is only up to 15.4 watts. Yeah. So regardless of even if it's only uh, only a shave over 15.4, it still has to use AT standards for it to draw that power. And, and it's very much are going to be seeing higher wattage. Uh, over time as well, because um, like I say, four by four access points are here. They're using newer technologies like smart beaming, uh, beam forming, all these newer technologies, and they require power to actually drive these mechanisms as well. Yeah. Plus the fact that we're having more and more users using access points all the time, newer technologies, and that's not even accounting for the apps that are being used. So a phone maybe in the past when you first got phones maybe you're running one or two apps on it now if you think all the apps that are running in the background and they're all running with wi-fi 6 devices as well that's a lot of data that's being passed through at any given time sure uh, Luke, luke's just followed up on on the question there craig um and he's put for the new x eighty three twenty ap uh, is 20 watts going to be real for it uh, to drive it yes I mean what we do on our data sheets is we have a maximum consumption sure. here's the part that people miss um, never spec up an access point <laughs> amount for the switches that's over the budget of the switch exactly. so for example I, I've mentioned um, 193 watts of power mm. uh, generally on a PoE switch that we sell and that's that's not a max power switch that's a normal standard 28 24 port PoE switch, 28 port, whatever, whatever you want to look at. Um, so if you take that 193 divided by the wattage of the power, it will give you how many access points you can run on that switch. Yeah. Now, when you start exceeding that number, you're forgetting that sometimes you have to reboot that switch. Now, when you reboot that switch, the access points don't run that idle speed. They they broke, they they cram as much power as they can right up to the top amount of that consumption absolutely up to the top because they're, they're turning on all the features they're running the diagnostics they're running the programs um, and you, these are usually built on boot, bootloaders to run the operating systems of these devices so it absolutely is going to run the top amount of consumption for that ap at that given moment after it's booted up it'll probably go down and idle depending on how it's used and how many people are connecting more more people connecting to it more devices uh the higher the power will go up to that total consumption but uh, always always factor that in that when you restart these devices they pull the, the highest amount of power and it's the same thing for cameras as well it's not just access points uh, so do be very very careful about it um, yes some of the newer technologies are there they don't always necessarily use um, a more amount of power but yes uh, they, if, if it's designed to run in an 802.380 standard it definitely will be below that 30 watts um, so you don't need to worry about it. Just look for the standards and make sure the switch is able to cope with those standards. And then always look at the total consumption for each device you're putting in. Brilliant. A lot okay. of questions today, Craig. They've, they've tacked, the, our, our viewers have taxed us to the edge of our... Um, <laughs> we, we, we might have to put these sessions in for an hour going on because we're coming up to an hour now. But uh, <laughs> let's see, see how that is. Um, so thanks, um, thanks everyone uh, for sending through your questions. Um, that was uh, very kind of you. Um, 
Our usual contact details are up on the screen if you want to follow up on anything that we've talked about. Um, if you want to talk more about Nucleus, if, if you want to talk to us about our Wi-Fi 6 units, if you want a Wi-Fi 6 unit to um, have a play with, then, then we can have a discussion about the uh, not-for-resale rates that we can, we, we can offer you on, on those products. Um, if you want 15 minutes um, in the diary with Craig, he, he hates every time I offer this out, but I always do. <laughs> <laughs> um, Craig, will, Craig will be happy to talk you through um, all, all of the options on Nucleus and, and, and give you a demonstration of, 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 the, of the platform there. Uh, as, as I mentioned, we'll be back in two weeks' time. Um, we're going to be talking about network redundancy, uh, a bit more on stacking if, if the stacking talk um, was, was, was good for you today. We'll be doing it in a bit more depth um, in, in a couple of weeks' time. Um, so hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll see you all again um, um, for the next exciting episode of our D-Link webinars. Thanks, then. Bye now. Thanks, everyone. Bye.